how's everybody doing? Are we ready for Hosea and Joel? Hosea and Joel. And hopefully you were, like, hopefully you read it. I really hope you read it. Did you read it? Or listen to it? Okay, listen to it. It's the same thing. And um, just, just lazier, and I love that. Uh, yeah. No, it's a good thing. You, like, learning how to, like, hear things is a good thing. Uh, so, good. So, I, I want to, like, we, it would be nice to go back to how we used to, where it was like, I'm going to be a little briefer and give you a chance for questions. Um, hopefully, we have those. That would be a nice thing. But, so, we're looking at Hosea, and we're looking at Joel, two books. Um, it wasn't that long ago that I taught the Minor Prophets, so... You can also go listen to those for more in-depth things. But Hosea most likely was writing in the like 750 to 722 BC, so before Christ. Um, Sometime after that, the messages of Hosea were collected and edited and copied. Um, We're not really clear how, when, and all, but some point, you know. Hosea is most likely written by Hosea. There's no reason to think it was written by anybody else. Um... It's an interesting book. Why don't you tell me what you know about the book of Hosea? What did you learn in your readings about the book of Hosea? Okay, it was written to Israel. That's right. It's very important. It was written to Israel. He was very influenced by the idea of the just living by faith. Yeah, um, it was a massive, mainly in Romans is where it hit him, but it's a quote. So yes. 100%. Good, good. Really good, John. Yeah, so his wife, Gomer, right? That's an interesting situation, right? So, spoiler alert, let's just get right to it. God tells Hosea, marry a prostitute. I don't even have a sentence after that. It's just so good on its own, you know. Yeah, I mean, wow. Like, what goes through your mind, you know, when that... All the stuff, right? And not only does he marry then the, the uh, Gomer, and then they have kids. So this Jose is easy to go through, guys. It's a really quick and simple read. Not only does he marry her and they have kids, but then she leaves. She goes back to her old ways. And then God says to Hosea, go get her and bring her home. And he actually goes and he has to buy her back. And he does so and brings her home and locks her up. This is not marriage advice. Seriously. But it was just like this really interesting. And then through this whole process, God brings healing and so on. And um, then God gives the whole message for why he does this. He's like, that's you, Israel. You are that person. You are the person, and I think, well, okay, hold on. I got a whole, I'm going to preach. Let's, back to you. What else do you know about Hosea? Good Lord. It's one, it's, by the way, one of my most favorite Old Testament books. I could teach it and have taught it anywhere and everywhere I can. I love it. I think it's one of the most beautifully written books in the whole Bible. I'm biased. Yes, ma'am. Totally. It's an analogy of our relationship with God. And it sucks. It's hard. It's a tough one. Okay, we'll talk about why that is. Yeah, exactly right. It's an analogy of relationship with God. God bless you. What else? What else? Anything else you want to add to Hosea? Hosea? Yes, sir. Yeah. Yes. The only one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's like, he's in heaven. He's like, wait, so you didn't have to do that? <laughs> I just had to lay on my side. I cooked on my poop, you know, okay. But uh, so they all have their stories. But yeah, Hosea is like, wow. But I wonder if everybody up there is going, oh my gosh, Gomer's the real prize. She's the real prize. We'll talk about that. We'll talk about that. But you're right, Carlos. No, nobody, but nobody else had anything quite like that. And which has led a lot of scholars, by the way, to believe that. You know, oh, well, you know, it says that she was a prostitute, but it, wasn't, it didn't mean this, and it doesn't mean that. And there's lots of arguments for maybe it means a little bit different than what we said, but it's a real hard, like, it's really stretching something to do that. The, um, and once you have to start stretching too far, it's easier to just, like, accept the, the basic, 
for what it is, you know? Like, you just see it for what it is, and you say, okay, that's what it means. So, end of story. So, yeah, but there are different, like, perspectives on it. None that are, you, you just, you can't, you can't prove a different perspective, but you can always make a different perspective. Doesn't mean it's right. So, I'm not, there's not really a lot of conversation to it, though. Anything else that you know about Hosea that you want us to know, that you know, that we should know? Anything else to the book? Okay, did you have any questions as you were reading the book? I'm doing that right away before I do my bit. No. I won't ask afterwards. After I start talking, you don't get to. No, I'm just kidding. I'll let you still, but if you haven't, did anybody have any questions? No. Okay. So then I, I probably as we're talking, it'll open up some. What, what makes Hosea probably one of the most unique and like beautiful books in the, um, in the Old Testament and really in the New Testament is this stark contrast from what God asks. Like you have Hosea, who's this prophet. And we have this kind of assumed belief that if a guy is a prophet, he must be a good person, right? And so then you go like, okay, here's the good person being asked to marry the quote unquote, the bad person, Right? And we're told that she's a bad person, right? We're not like, you're not guessing. Like, she is, and again, for all intents and purposes, the Bible just says she's a prostitute and I want you to go marry her. So, like, let's be clear on the distinctions here. You have this prophet who's, a, generally speaking, you think of him, he's going to be like a moral, good person. And then you have the prostitute who, generally speaking, when you think of prostitute, you don't think of like high moral standard. So, you have this huge contrast. And then you have God saying, I want you to go marry her. Now let's get out of the way right away. No, God has never ever said that to anyone else in that capacity ever again. That's like, why, like, or, or why Hosea and is it fair and all that kind of stuff? Irrelevant, totally irrelevant because it happened. You can't philosophize on the things that are already past. That's Leave that to, you know, ivory towers. We have no idea. I can't explain, like, well, here's why God did this. There's no good justification for it at all. Other than, and again, this is not the reason either. It's a great analogy. But again, wouldn't it suck to find out that your life was just a giant analogy? So it was not. That's an unfair thing. You can't say, you know, Jose's not in heaven going, I hope you got the picture. You know, it's, that, that's not the, that's not, but it is a great picture, but that's not why God did what he did. So we got to be clear about that. <laughs> in terms of, excuse me, why? There's really not a good answer to that. Not a clean one. So you have uh, the Hosea, the prophet, and then you have Gomer, the prostitute. And then you have God say, I want you to go and reach out and marry her. And he does it. And we don't know about the argument that goes on in his mind. We don't know about the debate. We don't know if there even was one. That's an assumption because we put ourselves in his shoes, right? Like, well, if I was in his shoes, right? And this is the book that I think highlights one of the, like, there's a principle I like to always, I, I, I say it a lot. You hear me say it a lot. But you should know it kind of is birthed out of the book of Hosea. And it's this, like, you and I are more like the other person than we are like Jesus. Right? I've said that to us a lot. So like if there is like, because when you read the New Testament, and this was a really popular, remember that what would Jesus do? It's a great, great idea. Um, you know, okay, Jesus was talking to this person and this is what he did and this is what he said and like, I want to be like Jesus. But the hard thing is, is when you do that, you, uh, you're making the assumption that you're Jesus in the story. When we first read the Bible, we have to read the Bible as, as if like God is wanting to speak to me. And so if I do that, I have to go, okay, who am I the most like in any given story in the Bible? Take any story you want from the Gospels and I can prove to you, you're more like the other person than you are like Jesus. You and I are closer to every sinner mentioned in the Bible. We just are. If you look at standards, we're closer. I'm closer to the dead people Jesus raised from the dead than I am to like the eternal living God, the source of all power and life, right? So when you do that, and the book of Hosea is the starkest contrast of this totally. We all read, the first time you read Hosea, you go, okay, well, how would I react if God called me to do that? He's not calling you to do that. You're Gomer, you're not Hosea. This is the hard part of reading. This is why it's such a stark and important contrast. Because we all do it. I'm not, so I'm not like, putting any of us down, but we, we read Hosea and we're like, man, if God asked me to be, or, you know, my marriage is kind of struggling and I just need to be like Hosea. Dude, your wife ain't Gomer, knock it off. 
And you're not Hosea. You can't, there's no, that's not the picture that we are supposed to be having when you read the story of Hosea and Gomer. But you are supposed to get away. And by the way, how do I know this? Because the, the, what is the point of it all? It's that Israel was Gomer. Israel was rejecting God, but he was going after them. And he would get them. And so, right there you know, okay, then he's saying even his own people are not the good guy. And that also makes us, it changes the way that you see people, right? If you are wanting to be Hosea, then I promise you it's because all of us on some level have a bit of a savior complex. Like, oh, I would be the one to rescue. I would be, you know, we all like, if I was back in that time, I would have been, you would have been exactly like everybody else. It's the whole point of human nature. So, so you, you transplant, our, we transplant ourselves into the story of Hosea and we're like, I am going to, I would do this. I, if God asked me to do this, I would do that. I would be, you know. No, you're not that person in the story. You misappropriated who you are. You and I are the person that is so far from God. Not the one who's being used by God to reach out to lost people. That's not who we are first. We're the ones who are lost. And so again, if you look at Hosea and you look at um, Gomer, now let me, let me ask you this. Okay, so between, like, is, do you feel like, and this, I don't do, uh, you know I don't do trick questions unless I tell you it's a trick, then it's not even trick anymore. So who's, like, is, would you agree Hosea is like kind of the moral person in the marriage between Hosea and Gomer? Pretty easy, pretty easy stark contrast, right? Okay, now I want to add a third person into this picture. You ready? Hosea and Gomer. Who's better? Morally, who's the better person? Hosea. Okay, now I'm going to introduce one more person. I'm going to introduce God into the equation. Now I want you to figure out how much more holy and better is Hosea and to Gomer when you bring God into the equation? Doesn't it become extremely minuscule? Have you ever like gone up on like the Empire State Building or any tall building and then you look down, you can see people below. You don't look down and go, wow, that guy's like 6'4". Because you're at such a high perspective that looking down, you just, everybody looks like they're all tiny. Kareem Abdul-Jabbar could be down there and he looks tiny. Because you're at an advantage in terms of how you're seeing the world. And so again, like when you, when you consider God and holiness, is Hosea's holy morality that much better than Gomer's in connection to a perfect and a holy God? What would you say? It's not. That changes the whole story, doesn't it? The story begins with, here's this amazing guy, loving God, called by God to marry a prostitute. What a guy, what a hero. He's rescuing one person at a time. Then you bring God into it and you're like, oh wait, hold on a second. That's not the story. It's not the story of a good guy marrying a bad girl. It's a story of two relatively bad people <laughs> who meet God. Hosea meets God his way and Gomer meets God a different way. And so this beautiful picture of Hosea and Gomer are a really op great opportunity for us, each one of us, to say, I am not the good guy in the story. It doesn't mean I can't learn the lessons. It doesn't mean like in the, like I wouldn't want you to walk away and say, well, then I don't learn anything from Hosea. Of course we should learn from the life of Hosea. Of course we learn from the example of Jesus and how to treat people and how to act and all that. But you just have to remember you're not Jesus in the story and I'm not Jesus in the story. That right there alone, that level of humility changes your whole life. It just changes everything. Because now I don't look at people as if I'm the one that I'm the savior to bring something because then I'd look down on people. Instead, you just say, okay, we're all in the same category. God might be using my life, but it doesn't make me greater than. It just gives me this opportunity. So the picture that we see is this. God, Hosea marries her, right? She's probably, you know, we don't know. We don't know exactly, but... She seems happy to get off the streets or whatever life she had, has kids, never adjusts to that life. She just never adjusts to that life. And right there, I would want you to think of the book of Galatians, okay? Because the whole book of Galatians is about the idea of Christians 
who were given their freedom but go back into bondage. Legalism. And Paul would say like, you've been set free. Why are you going back into bondage? Let me tell you why we go back into bondage. We know it. It's a familiarity. It's something comfortable. And that's exactly what happens with Gomer. Gomer goes back to the life she knew. You know, gets married. Yay, I'm out of that life. Has a kid. Oh my gosh, I didn't know I could love something so much. Has another one. Oh, I didn't know they could spit up so much. I didn't know how hard this would be. I didn't know. I didn't know. I didn't know. And man, those old things kind of, you know, I had, you know, it's, it's, the, it's the children of Israel in the wilderness. You remember when they were like, man, it was so much better in Egypt. Like, yo, you hated Egypt. You were slaves in Egypt. Yeah, but we had food. You made the food. Like, what are you talking about? It's so much easier to see things in a, in a different perspective when we get our eyes off of God. And that's exactly what happened. So Gomer goes back. She goes back into her old life. And it seems like it's even worse because now she's like indebted to a pimp is what it sounds like. And so Hosea goes in and he barters for buying his wife back. And then, then God drops the hammer on the whole story. He says, Israel, you are Gomer. You are Gomer. Meaning, I rescued you and you enjoyed relationship with me. But when it wasn't familiar, when it was still faith, you know, faith will never, if you, listen, I want to really recommend you consider this. Faith will never get more comfortable. It grows, but it doesn't get more comfortable. The very nature of faith means you're trusting in something unseen and someone unseen. And you can't, you, it can grow, you can grow the muscle of faith, but the idea that it becomes comfort and, and easy is not true. Which is why we fall back to familiar. Now you build habits. This is what this is. The, you build the habit of like I'm going to be in church. I'm going to study the Word of God. I'm going to read. I'm going to do my devos. I'm going to pray. I'm going to all these things. Then you create like something that is familiar. But the idea of like trusting God. So you can go to church. I mean, and again, I'm, uh, we all know this. You can go to church but not be trusting God, right? You can go through the familiar but not actually be having faith in God. And so we want to like not just go through the familiar in our life. But we want to become people of greater and deeper faith. And Gomer went to back to familiar. Israel went back to familiar. They went back to their old gods. They went back to just worship. They didn't go back to Egypt, but they went back to the same old ways, just living for their own things. And so just as Hosea went to go get Gomer back, God says, I'm coming after you again. And you're going to go into, you're going to go into captivity. You're going to go, um, I'm going to take you away from me. This is not punitive. This is not punishment. This is what happens when you walk away from me. But I'm going to get you back. I will get you back. And I would compare this to, you know, Philippians. That he who began a good work in you will be faithful to complete it. Right? Um, okay. Do you have any questions now that I've said that these things? Yes, sir. Yes. Yeah. Right. Okay, so now let's go back to the analogy. I was doing that to separate from analogy. Like, you want to see things from the analogy perspective? So we can go back to that. But you also want to just see things for what they really are. You know, like, it's as if I was to look at your marriage as only an analogy. It can't only be an analogy. It can also be an analogy, but not only an analogy. So then I could say, oh man, their marriage is such a great analogy of faithfulness. But it's also like your lives, right? So you're real people. So the point is, is we can look at the analogy now. Let's do that. But I want you to also see this is two people. This is two people with God in the center of that relationship. So the analogy, who do you think Hosea is? I know you already know, it's Jesus. So that's absolutely correct by analogy. That's by analogy, it's 100%. It's just that every story in the scripture is also analogy, but not only analogy. Okay, does that make sense, everybody? That makes sense, okay. So he's most certainly a picture of Jesus. Most certainly, yeah. It's a great picture, ooh. That's why I say it's my favorite picture in the whole Old Testament. I think it's just, it's unreal. 
Any other questions on Hosea? Da, na, na. Yes, sir. It seems that way. Yeah. Yeah, not my child. Yeah, 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 yeah. Really fun names. Yes. Yep. The whole story is redemptive. To to the extent of like you brought in people that are not even a part of me, but I'm going to love them. It's the most massive, beautiful, redemptive story in the Bible, I, in my opinion. I like it more than Ruth. A lot of people like Ruth. No disrespect if you like the Ruth story, but I like this one. This is my favorite. This is my favorite. Possibly. It's, uh, there's the, the idea that maybe like the, those that were not of me but are brought into my family. And so what does Paul call that in the book of Romans? What does he say? What is the word he uses to describe Gentiles being brought into the kingdom of God? Grafted in or adopted in? Same idea. Very, very possible. That it, it's a, this, this book covers this whole picture of the work of God in the kingdom of God, reaching his child or his bride, and then, but also him adopting and bringing in the whole kingdom of Gentiles, the people of the, that are not of the Jewish faith. So super powerful. Told you, it's a great book. Any other thoughts or questions on Hosea? Yes, sir. Yeah. Yep. Oh, yeah. Yeah. It's a, let me restate it just so for those that um, they get mad at me when I don't. But yeah, just talking about bringing up the book of Galatians and how bondage it can be towards sin, but it can also be towards the sin of religion and of legalism. Absolutely. Go ahead. Keep going if you wanted to say anything else. Yeah. Yeah. And I think it's just the part that like never, I mean, we all know it, but we forget it how much bondage religion can be. It can be terrible bondage, but it can become the thing that is familiar so we don't think of it that way. Uh, you know, we see somebody strung out, homeless on the street, and we're like, oh, look at that bondage. Another person who's just a serial gossip in a church who everybody avoids and doesn't say anything to and doesn't, when they say, can I pray for you? You say, nope, I'm good. You know, that's a bondage as well. Does that make sense? Like there's so many versions of bondage and yet, Galatians reminds us we're all gravitating in that direction if we're not because faith is an uncomfortable thing. It's very uncomfortable to trust God when I can't see it. And you can say like, well, I've already done it enough times. I'm, I'm comfortable. You're not comfortable. You might be learning and growing and getting stronger in that, but you're not comfortable. There will be no faith in heaven, but until then there will be. You don't need to believe in heaven because you'll be there. But until then, it's a struggle for all of us. It's deep. Okay, any other questions on Hosea? The book of Joel is a really great little book as well. Um, what do you know about the book of Joel? Anything that you know about it that's, that you want us to know? Okay, it's, it's a prophetic book, yep. It's very prophetic. Anything else? Okay, yeah. There's certain like kind of really famous like little statements that come from the book of Joel that we know of. Yep. Okay, obviously we do think it's written by Joel. Um, no reason not to. Um, we don't know much about Joel and we don't know any, I mean, and it says he's the son of Pethuel and we don't know anything about that guy either. So that's like, you know, when it's like you say like, oh, oh, do you know this guy? And you're like, no, I don't know that guy. What about this guy? No, but I don't know that guy either. You're like, oh, well, I don't know how to help you. And that's the book of Joel. We don't really know a lot about these guys. Um, no hometown um, identified, no occupation identified. Um, the first uh, verse tells us that he was a prophet. 
But other than that, you know, like we know Amos, we know what Amos does, we know what a lot of these guys, who they were, but uh, Joel, we just don't really know much about Joel. So um, it kind of makes it a little bit more fun and a little bit more mysterious. It seems that it was written in the 500s. It seems that it was written sometime in the, that's one of the ideas of dating. Dating is always difficult with books with no reference point. It's a, a really difficult. So you can have a 700 BC dating and you can have a 500 BC dating. There's no reason for us to be too concerned about either of them, but just that's the point is it's somewhere in there. Um, some even believe earlier as in closer to us in the 400. So don't exactly know. Uh, Joel calls the people to recognize a plague that was coming and that that plague that was coming was a sign from God that they should repent. And then he goes on to envision a final judgment when God will punish evil nations and vindicate Israel. So, uh, you know, this, this swarm of locusts was going to happen. Um, of course, it did happen in history. Uh, he describes it in chapter 1, verse 2 through 2, 17. This call for lament and the terror of this thing that was going to happen. Um, there, that the people should... Let this event be a sign. And so this gives me an opportunity to kind of mention this. Like, it's one of those dangers that we can often um, have and not realize that we're doing that. Not, I don't mean we as in you and me, but just kind of the colloquial we. Um, we can tend to, um, so like God calls, God uses Joel to say, hey, there's this plague coming and I want you to see this as a sign from God. And so then we now kind of make an equivalence that every bad thing that happens is a sign from God. And right, so, um, you know, oh my gosh, you know, that earthquake in Iran, it must be a sign from God. Or that, you know... That particular thing, and it's a very, do um, you guys know what I'm talking about? Like when we just kind of, like we do that. Um, happened a lot after 9-11. You heard that a lot, right? We need to repent because God is trying to, and I think telling people to, that repentance is important is always a good lesson. But when we kind of, um, you got to remember, so what's the, what's the theory behind this? Okay, God specifically told Joel these things, and then he told him to prophesy those things. That's the difference. So if God is like, Jesus also told us bad things were going to happen to the good and the bad. Not everything becomes a sign from God in a specific way. Everything that happens, God knows. It's not like anything has ever happened and God didn't know. But it's not fair that everything is like, well, that's a sign. What are you going to learn from that? What do you learn about what, what, what you did that was wrong? Unless God specifically said those things, we have to be very careful. I'll give you another example. In the book of Romans, it's something that trips up a lot of people that are, have a Reformed theology. I love Reformed theology for a lot of things and not into it on other things. Um, if you don't know what I mean by that, don't worry. It's not even that important. But um, in the book of Romans, Paul goes through in Romans 9, 10, and 11, he goes through this argument about the election of God for people. He chooses people, right? And then, and then there's this like incredible statement where Paul says this, to whomever I want to have mercy on, I will have mercy on. Do you realize what a non-threat that really is? The real threat would have been this, I can, I can send to hell whoever I want to send to hell. Because that's also true, right? But yet when God made the statement, because he says, Jacob, I have loved Esau, I have hated Oh my gosh, God hates some people and he sends some people down. And then the whole message of it all is it culminates with Paul writing that God says this, whom I will have mercy on, I will have mercy on. So in other words, it's like God is saying, if I want to be nice to, if I want to be nice to them, I will be nice to them. <laughs> it's like, well, that's not a threat. That sounds great. After all this talk, but here's what happens. You and I tend to try to like, you try to philosophize this and even theologize this, you get lost, right? Okay, if God's against some people, or if God, excuse me, if God is for some people, then he must be against other people. And that makes perfect sense. Right? If, if there's two people left to pick on the team, two people left to pick on the team, who wants to be on the team? Who can I pick on? Okay, you two, my two favorites. You're there, you love it. Okay. 
and I pick her to be on my team. So Javi's d assumption is he didn't want me on his team, right? I chose one, that means I, and if I didn't choose him, then I'm against him, right? And yet at the very end of that, God's message is, I will show mercy to whomever I will show mercy to. It's not that, so we can't understand that. That's a, there's a point where you're just going to get struck by that. So you have to say, when God intentionally tells us, this is a sign that I am giving to show you your need for repentance, then we should accept that. But we should not then assume that every catastrophe becomes a sign with the same message when God did not say that. Does that make sense? That's a really important thing because it'll help you. And oftentimes it becomes a very ethnocentric version of that. Here's what I mean. We will, something bad, you know, an earthquake kills 20,000 in Iran, and I'll hear, I'll, I'll, you know, nothing, no, none of our, like, not, not like us, but like, there's kind of those like wackanoodle Christians, like, oh, God is telling them that. And then, and then a flooding destroys so many big, beautiful cities in North Carolina, and those same people are silent. Why is that? Because we're the good guys. We're the good guys. That couldn't be God. Of course he would send an earthquake to those people. Pagans, Muslims. You see what I'm saying? And again, I'm not talking in the realm of normal Christianity. I'm talking on the fringe. Uh, it's kind of creeped into normal, but usually it used to be fringe. So I hope that makes sense. Unless God says it, you shouldn't equivocate that with, oh, that's a sign. God has to speak that before you assume that. Yeah. Uh, yep. That's right. The Tower of Siloam fell and it just fell. And you're like, yeah, but God knows everything. Yeah, but we don't. And he's speaking to us as humans. Some things just happen and it has not, it, just let it be. Good and evil happen to, the sun rises and falls on the good and the bad. So yeah, that's a really like, that's a, that's a point where a lot of people have taken Old Testament thought, tried to apply that to every cat catastrophic event. By the way, I think it's a great, you know, I think there's a real like beautiful value to, you know, I think again, I think back most of us, you know, you think of 9-11 and then the message of, hey guys, whatever this was, this is a great opportunity for us to come back to Christ. I think that's a great message. But then to say, well, this is what we deserve or this is what you get, these things get just, it goes too far. It goes too far. The only thing, I mean, if that's the case, we all deserve that. So the message of the scripture is that whom I will show mercy to, I will show mercy to. I got to, I was um, speaking at, you guys know, um, there's a Calvary pastor named Ken Graves up in Maine. He's kind of a crazy guy. I love him. I, I, we're friends, that's why. And so I actually flew, we flew, Joey and I flew into um, America on the 18th after the 9-11. And I was a chaplain, civilian chaplain serving with the U.S. military in a NATO base in um, for, it's called K4, S4, like Kosovo 4, Serbia 4. So I had a chaplain badge. So I went to, I was um, going to Ken's church, but I went through New York. So I got to go serve down there. Man, they had such great conversations with people, open to God, right? But the message was not, hey, dude, you know, you know this happened because you didn't repent. What a terrible thing to say to people, right? Your kid's sick because of you. This happened because of you. Why would we do that to each other? A lot of that comes actually from Old Testament when God specifically did say this is why, but when God is silent, we should really be shutting our mouths too on those things. So I hope that makes sense. And again, you're not the ones, it's, but there's fringe elements of that that you'll hear that. You'll hear people say, oh, I know that you feel like this. No, I don't feel that way. God is not angry. God's not angry at the world. God took out all of his anger on his son Jesus on the cross. Like God has no wrath towards humanity. He's grieved, the Bible says, right? Do not grieve the Holy Spirit. The Bible never says don't make God angry. Why? He already took out all of his anger on his son Jesus. Think of how bad, how as bad as the world is, he's not angry. I'm so sad for you, but I, I can still work. You know what I mean? That's such a different perspective. So, okay, any questions on that? Sorry, I, I pontificated. Okay, so after he tells about this locust plague and then that this is a, a call to repentance, in chapter two, he moves into this like theme that we would call, it's called the, the day of the Lord, right? And then we hear about the day of the Lord in the New Testament as well. And there are those people who are literalists that will say the day of the Lord is referring to a day. Most good scholarship means it, that day here does not mean a 24 hour period, but a season, the season, the moment, the time. And um, so does that kind of make sense, right? Here's the problem with that. When you do that, 
you say, well, hold on a second, but we believe, that the, we believe in the seven days of creation. They're not just seasons. Well, maybe they are. Maybe they were. We don't know. Do you see what I'm saying? Like you get a little bit confused in there. But the term the day of the Lord is most likely, and especially we see in the New Testament, it's more of a reference to a time. The time of the Lord, the end of all things, not just a one day kind of a deal. And uh, in, during the day of the Lord, um, the, you know, this locust plague, he begins to speculate on or prophesy on the day of the Lord, God's final judgment. On that day, God will act to bring justice to the world. There'll be signs in heaven, battles on earth. It'll be a bad day for nations who have opposed the Lord. It'll be a day of pain, a, a day of sorrow. And um, now, of course, he also, this is what's always so cool about all the prophets, it's also, there's hope, right? It's the book of Hosea lived out in every single prophetic book, both major and minor prophet. There's bad, there's, there's catastrophic, there's terrible, and then there's still hope. God is still not finished bringing redemption, bringing life. Prophets like Isaiah, Jeremiah, Amos, and Micah, though not rejecting Israel's worship life, are critical of the temple rituals, where Joel focuses his, his focus is on like the people, the life of the people. It's not just focused on kind of the temple the temple thing itself. Now, there's also a call to repentance in verse 12 of chapter 2. Therefore, thus says the Lord, turn to me with all your heart, with fasting, with weeping, and with mourning. Rend your heart, not your garments. Return to the Lord your God, for he is gracious and merciful, slow to anger, and of great kindness. And he relents from doing harm. So, great, 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 great verse. Great section. Of course, also, there is... Um, well, okay, what else, is there anything else you know about Joel before I, I get there? Anything else that you can think of from the book of Joel? Can you think of any famous New Testament apostle who might have quoted from Joel? <laughs> and do you remember who quotes that in the New Testament? The, the kind of the, the first one? It's Peter, that's right, in the book of Acts. When he gets up to preach, he quotes from the book of Joel, which is pretty impressive. Okay. Did you, yeah, Michael. Are, are you Go ahead, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Um, could, could, could the term the day of the Lord in Joel be more imprecise? Could it have a near and a far? Absolutely. It has to. Yeah, it's what we call progressive revelation. It, uh, progressive revelation means it has an immediate and it has a long term. It has a, it, it, it is now, but it, it, it's a, how we, how I describe the kingdom of God. It's the, the, it's the now and yet it's, it has a now and it has a yet. So that's, we call that progressive revelation. Definitely the day of the Lord has that where you have these signs and these pictures and this analogies and all that. But then also it's a day that is coming. I think it's both. Absolutely. Yep. I think it's possible. So let me explain what we're talking about now because this gets into, a di like, there's different views of how the world ends, <laughs> so to speak, and what it means, what the end times are. You have, like, for instance, a lot of people within our particular version of evangelical Christian, not all evangelical, but just our version of it, we are what you would call a pre-tribulational dispensationalist. Put that on a, credit, on a business card, you know. And you're like, I didn't even know I was that. And why did you swear at me? No, it's not a swear word. Here it is. Pre-tribulational, like, and again, not everybody believes this. Not even close. Not everybody believes this. And there's a great godly people who think differently. I'm just giving you the different thought. Pre-tribulational means that like, it's the view that, that the rapture of the church would happen before the tribulation begins. Dispensational is a, is a, is a form of theology. It's, a, it's what we call a systematic theology. I mentioned reformed earlier, now dispensational. Dispensational, dispensationalists believe, by the way, I, I would say I am not dispensational, so you'll, you probably aren't either, but I'll, I'll explain it. It's when you see the different ages of human history as dispensations of God's working. So this is how God worked in Adam's time. This is how God worked in Moses' time. This is how God worked in David's time. This is how God worked in, in the prophet's time. This is how now God works in the new covenant. 
It's like we're looking at different covenants and different ways in which God worked. I used to like that. I think it's a great way of at least understanding human history. The problem is, is that, and this is where I think reformed is better, God is the same to all people. But what is expressed might be unique. And I'm, I'm getting off topic, but I'm going to come back to the 70 AD thing. Dispensation, dispensationalists when it comes to end times, we believe in a literal return of Christ and a millennium and an end of, like that, okay? Not everybody believes that. You have another group of people, um, they're called preterists. And a preterist believed that these things occurred in 70 AD. And that, so that was the day of the Lord. And, but can it be then and yet coming? I would, I'm a, I'm a believer in that. Okay. Did I confuse you all well enough? Partial preterism. Yeah. It has to be. Yep. They believe that everything's already happened. Like we're basically, I don't know what we're living in, but it already happened. But there were some really famous Christians who were preterists and they were just wrong, really wrong. Uh, And I would even avoid partial preterism because I think that connects you to partial heresy. I think more, I believe in that there is the day of the Lord, there is things that have happened then and that they will be fulfilled in the future. That would be a, so so like another version of our form of like would be a post-tribulational person. That just means they believe that, that the rapture would happen at the end of the tribulation. Okay, and, and they're, they're going to be in heaven and we'll all be to, in heaven together. We're not, it's not a, those are not heretical positions in any way, shape. There's others that are like, we call them all millennialists. They don't believe that, they think it's all just a um, symbol. So the millennium is not describing an actual thousand year reign, but it's just like a, a picture of what God's going to be doing and working out. And, and again, there's a lot of great Christians that thought that way. Um, I think it's not true, but I'm not going to lose sleep over that one, you know. So, make sense? Confuse you enough? Hopefully. I just threw a bunch of big words at you. That doesn't help, does it? Okay. Yes, ma'am. Could you equate the prophecies that Joel gives in the twenty eight to modern female pastors? Oh, interesting. I didn't think it was going there. I love when a question goes in a different direction than I expected. Okay, can I equate, could you equate the prophecy of Joel chapter 2 to modern day today female pastors? Interesting. Never thought about it. Let's read it because I don't know. Okay, where am I reading? Joel 2 verse 28. It'll come to pass afterward that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and your daughters will prophesy. Your old men will dream dreams. Your young men will see visions. On my men servants and maid servants, I will pour out my spirit. I will show wonders in the heavens and in the earth, blood, fire, pillars of smoke. Sun will be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the coming of the great and awesome day of the Lord. And it comes to pass that whoever calls in the name of the Lord will be saved. For in Mount Zion and in Jerusalem, there shall be deliverance as the Lord has said among the remnant whom the Lord calls. So help me understand what you're thinking. Okay, got it. Okay, because it's saying both men and women will prophesy. Okay, um, I think that men and women in all time, in all of history, the Bible is already clear, men and women can be prophets. Uh, Philip's daughters were prophetesses, right? Which is a, such a dumb word to use, but yeah. They were prophets. Let's just degender the word prophet rather than prophetess. Yeah, they were prophets. We know that for a fact. So I wouldn't use this, and I don't believe anyone has ever used this as a, to try to like say, hey, this is proof that women should be pastors. Now, that's a different topic that we could, we can also talk about. I'm not, I'm just saying, I think here, this is a reminder that in the last days, God wants to pour out a spirit on everybody. He wants everybody prophesying, everybody, you know. And, but it, all throughout human history, all throughout church history, it's been both men and women as prophets, evangelists, uh, apostles. Uh, so. Oh, got it. Yeah, yeah. And I think those people are wrong for thinking that. I've known a lot of great women pastors. 
Churches, so this is what we would call a secondary issue. Okay, and then another big word, tertiary, just means third. I don't know why they don't just say third, but tertiary. It, these are secondary issues. Secondary meaning they are not a gospel, like it is not an issue of salvation. Uh, I would, uh, baptism is another secondary issue, right? Should we sprinkle? Should we do this? Like, bro, whatever you got, you use. If the water's cold, warm it up and shove it on them. I mean, whatever. But that's, oh no, unless you do it this way. Our movement tends to be quite, I'll use the word, not good about this stuff. I was going to say just misogynistic, but I'll be nicer. So we tend to make, so our movement has a hard time um, differentiating primary and secondary. A lot of churches are really good at that. In fact, most church denominations and church movements even have like books out on their, this is like, this is what's primary and this is what is flexible. And um, the Southern Baptists have that. Again, we don't have to agree with them, but they have it. Um, the evangelical, uh, the EFCA, Evangelical Fellowship of Christian, not athletes, so what am I trying to, EFCL, you know, anyways, they have a, a great book and they call it, I can't think of what their names are, it's, they're evangelical somethings, everybody's evangelical something. They have a great book that's, um, it's called the, Doc, the Theology of Silence. And what they say is this, where the Bible is silent as this is a primary issue, we're going to remain silent. Just on, on a multitude of issues, whatever they be. So the issue of women as pastors is certainly, certainly a secondary issue. But when you don't, when we're a part of a system that doesn't have secondary issues, so we're like the, um, you ever had those friends that like type in all caps? You ever read a book that was in all caps or read like a, a paragraph and you're like, stop yelling at me. We're those people because everything is primary. We don't have secondaries. Now we do, we just don't define it that way. If we did, we would not have the problems that we do. Uh, and so, yeah. Yeah, within our tradition, we say, no, we think, I mean, like, now the term, can I just make the comment, too, on women? The word pastor is what gets everybody a little up in a tiff, which it really doesn't need to. It just means like a shepherd. So, like, you'll have churches, again, we're, our churches, like the Calvary movement is a part of that. Like, you'll have, like, this pastor and this pastor and this pastor, and then you have, like, children's director. And you're like, why is that? Oh, it's a woman. So you have an 18-year-old doofus who's a pastor because he's a dude. A 48-year-old skilled professional, and she's a director. This stuff is silly. Silly. No need. It is, there's nothing biblical that is purely Western. We created that. It's a non-starter. Now, if you want to discuss what about the role of senior pastor, there's a case to be made where the scripture seems to say that that should be a guy. But churches that don't believe that, still secondary. Still secondary. So you won't ever hear me fight against, a, like, oh, this woman's a pastor. Oh, that tells you what kind of church it is. That's not true. Anybody heard of the Assemblies of God? Anybody ever thought of them as a liberal, terrible, wicked movement? They've always had women pastors. Because when you hear women pastors, you're like, oh, they must be, you know, heretical on every level. That is, that's us shouting in capitals. Second, it's a secondary issue. I'll get kicked out of Calvary for saying it, but whatever, you know. <laughs> Here I stand, bring it on, yeah. No, it just doesn't matter. It's, it's like, I mean, again, this is, this is my field. So yeah, it is a secondary matter. In terms of what we're talking about, so by the way, if we ever, like, if, like Daryl's our kids pastor, if it was a lady that was doing that, she'll be called the kids pastor. I'm just saying that. Because it's a term that we understand. It has nothing to do with like, oh, you can't say. We've gotten silly with that stuff. Silly, silly, silly. I'm not into that. I know. Words matter, so let's not parse them in weird ways. But in terms of this prophecy, it's even better than that. He's just saying, I want all of you to see your role. Like, I'm going to pour out my spirit, and I want all of you prophesying. I want all of you being used by God. I opened a different can of worms with what I just did there, but any other questions? I hope it made sense, too. I think it's... And by the way, I'm not like a product of 
oh, it's 2024 and that's just a liberal view. This is a biblical view. It always has been. It's just that it gets buried under a lot of culture. These things get buried under a t- crap ton of culture, sorry. And so we're trying to weed out the culture. And when you do that, you go, oh, that's what it means. <laughs> that's what it means, you know. Any other questions? Preferably, Joel. But if you want to, hey, I, I love the gray zone. My hair's gray. I might as well live there. I live there. So I love it. I don't mind it. I think the Bible speaks clarity. I don't mind speaking on it. So any other questions? So, so then um, the final thought then from me, and then I'll, I'll, I'll ask you again, or you can prep, it, prep your question. Peter quotes from this, and he says, we're in the last days. And I've taught you this before, but then when did the last days begin? According to the New Testament, when did the last days begin? Resurrection. Resurrection. When Jesus rose from the dead, the last days began. Which, by the way, that, so, then, so then it helps us, it, guards, it safeguards a little bit, right? When I hear somebody like, this thing just happened in, you know, wherever, Iran, or it's the last days. And you're like, bro, it's, it's been that way. We're in it. And that's not to mean like, oh, it doesn't matter. It means, dude, I, want, I don't care if nothing happened today prophetically. I'm already in the last days. I'm a part of that privileged group, and so are you, that like we're a part of a New Testament resurrected. We're in the last days. We are in the comma before Jesus comes back. That's exciting. I don't need anything to happen. That's even more. Like, if you're waiting for an event, then the event has to happen. If you're like me, which I, I think you are, we're like, I don't need anything to happen. Jesus is ready to come. When he's ready, he's coming back. So exciting. Oh, I love that. Okay. Yes, sir. Yes. Yes. It's, it is, this is a part of progressive. It is... It did and is still happening. It did and is and will. So um, Jesus said that like, if I go away, then I will send the Spirit. So that is what he's talking about. No question. And then, you know, God pouring out his Spirit. Now, the writers of the New Testament wrote in a way that it would be almost be really good for us to think this way. It would help us a little bit more. So like, let's say we pray with somebody to come to Christ, Right? That we could say it like this, God poured out his spirit upon them and they came into faith. Right? Isn't that true? And so, but we just don't use that. We don't talk that way. It's not a bad thing. It's just not how we use it. So we kind of forget God is still doing that. He's still pouring out his spirit now. There's a very, there's like, if if you've ever heard this, like there's different views on what does it mean to be filled with the Holy Spirit, right? We call it the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And like, so if you take my Southern Baptist friends, of whom I have so many, they don't believe in the baptism. I'm like, dude, you guys are called Baptists and you don't believe in the baptism of the Spirit and you're Baptists. But they just love dunking. They don't, it's not about that. They believe in the outpouring of the Spirit, but they believe when you are born again, you are filled, you are baptized in the Spirit. Now again, they don't use those words. Where then maybe more like Pentecostal side and in many ways we would fall into this category, we believe that like after salvation, there is still an opportunity for you to be filled with the Holy Spirit. And, um, and so, you know, those are just like distinctions without a lot of deep meaning. Um, but the Spirit was poured out in Acts chapter 2. No question. And he has been continually being poured out until Jesus comes back. So that is a really great, thank you for bringing that up. That's a great expression of right then and still happening. Good question. Any other questions? Yes, ma'am. All flesh is a reference to mankind. Spirit will be poured out on all flesh. On all, like, everyone will have access. So it does not mean that everybody is like, you know, hey, we're all, we all have the Spirit. No, no. It just means, like, everyone has, like, there's not a Christian who does not have access to the Spirit of God. Not one person. Yeah, that's a good question. Really good. Take one more question. Otherwise, yes, sir. It's a direct quote. Yep, exactly. Which is super cool because, I mean, in the book of Joel, nobody knew the idea of salvation by calling, by faith like that. 
right? Because how was a Jew saved? You grew up in a little town. Of course, it's nearing now, now that Halloween's over, it's apparently Christmas. So, you know, I was thinking Bethlehem and Nazareth, but there's other towns in Israel, right? Okay, so you grew up in, t- you're, you're a Jew in, in the city of Nazareth. How are you saved? That's a part of it, yeah. You, you do the classes, right? You learn the things. You do your bar mitzvah. Yeah, you memorize Torah. But is that how they were saved? These are all things they did, but how were they saved? Did they think of salvation as personal? Not at all, right? I would suggest to you they never even thought about being saved. They were saved because they were born. They were born a Jew. Their view was, yo, we're, we're in. And there's a case to be made for that a bit, isn't there? And yet all throughout the Old Testament, what are they told to do? You have to believe. So like if you're just born saved, then why did God keep sending prophets to say you need to repent? What are you repenting of if you were born that way? So they weren't born saved, were they? But that makes the most sense. But they weren't born a saved person. They still had to put their faith. They put their faith in the traditions. They put their faith in the sacrifices. They put their faith in the rituals. They put their faith in Torah. They were called to live by faith just as much as you're called to live by faith. But they, like many of us, struggle with the same problem. Well, I was born into that. Well, I just, that's my life. And yet, if that's true, then you can't, listen, I'll I'll use like a controversial thing. You can't tell somebody that they weren't born that way if you believe Jews were born saved. Do you see the point? Do you see how I did that? You can't do that. Oh, you weren't born that way. That's wrong. You can't do that. So we have to believe, and we do, that God called the Jew to put their faith in him just as much as he's calling you and me. Before Christ and after Christ. Why does that matter? Because in verse 32, he says it. Whoever, this is the thing that opens it up. The the radical part of this verse is not, you need to call on the name of the Lord. They knew that they had to believe him. But he says this, whoever. That means Jew, Gentile, whoever calls on the name of the Lord. And nobody understood that at the time. Not even the Jewish Christians in the beginning, in the first century understood this. It took a radical shift for them to understand that God could save Gentiles. Radical shift for God to, for them to see that. Yeah, I, I said last one, but you're the last one. Circumcision was the evidence it would be equivalent to baptism. It was the physical evidence, a lot worse than just getting wet in some water. <laughs> it was that, it was, the, it was the physical expression of a faith in God. Romans chapter 4 tells us how Jews were saved. Abraham believed and it was accounted to him to righteousness. And he is the father of faith. Romans 4 is the, is the jam. So. Okay, Lord, thank you so much for the, the night. And thank you for the book of Hosea and the book of Joel and all these great conversations and topics. Bless your people, Lord. It's so good. Like two nights this week, we've gotten to come together, pour out our heart in prayer and seek you and then to just spend some time in your word. I just pray blessing and grace over your people as we want to grow, become more like you. In Jesus' name, amen.